Hey, Rama, 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 Hare, hey, Hare. Hey. The day after Sri Krishna Janmashtami, we are so fortunate to be able to celebrate the appearance day of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Ranta Swami Prabhupada. We can never reach the limit of understanding the glories of Krishna's devotee, Srila Prabhupada. He demonstrated utmost dependency on Krishna, dedication to the order of his spiritual master, and the abandoning of any selfish concern. He simply focused on his service to Krishna and carrying out the order of his spiritual master. He's demonstrating bhakti yoga in perfection and demonstrating that within the material world by carrying out the mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Demonstrating bhakti in action. Demonstrating the unlimited power of chanting the holy names of Krishna. He explained how the official start of the Hare Krishna movement happened. He counted the beginning when he went to the park, Tompkins Square Park in New York. You can still go there today and you'll find the tree that Srila Prabhupada sat under and chanted. Uh, the tree has a plaque on it now, but there by the city of New York announcing that this is where the Hare Krishna movement began. And yes, Srila Prabhupada considered that part chanting as the official beginning. Because it was also noted in the newspapers, the New York Times. They had a picture of Prabhupada chanting in the park with his little band of hippies <laughs> dancing in front of him. It's interesting that he considers the chain, the public distribution of the Hare Krishna mantra as the official beginning. Not when he acquired a little place at 26th Second Avenue in New York City, which you can also visit. At least for now. We don't own the building, but we rent it. You can visit there. See this little shop? Srila Prabhupada considered the beginning when he and his assorted little group decided to go to the nearby park and do public chanting and public dancing. And Prabhupada would sing in the park for three hours at a time at his advanced age. <laughs> he said that was the official beginning. When the newspapers took note of the chanting in the park. In material life, we know the phenomenon of chewing that which has already been chewed. Puna Punas Charva, Charva Nana, as Prahlad Maharaj explains. That, in a nutshell, is the essence of so called material enjoyment. You are chewing what has already been thoroughly chewed, you're dealing with leftovers trying to warm up leftovers <laughs> that have been left over generation after generation. <laughs> you know, when you're really hungry, you, <laughs> at least in your days of living in the material world, when you're really hungry, you just search the house for leftovers. <laughs> Anything left over. 
<laughs> and you, whatever it is, you don't care. You're just trying to heat it up, microwave it or something. Leftovers. <laughs> so that is what material enjoyment is like. It's all leftovers. <laughs> but the illusory energy makes it look like this time there'll be some freshness there. This time there'll be some flavors you haven't noticed before in the leftovers. <laughs> so, one of the recommendations by mundane psychological experts these days is that, yes, it's true, material endeavors for enjoyment always lose their pizzazz, always lose their flavor. So therefore, one of the ways you're advised to keep chewing the chew, trying to squeeze some extra drop of pleasure out of the leftovers, one of the ways you're advised to do it is to think, what would I be like if I never had this enjoyment? And that helps you to squeeze more. <laughs> squeeze a drop of water out of a dry towel. What would, what would it have been like if I never had this experience or that experience? Even though it's so hackneyed and stale, still it's something. What would I be like without? What would I be like with nothing to enjoy? <laughs> so that way you can squeeze harder, you know? <laughs> you get the technique? <laughs> In other words, even though the experience is deficient and temporary, in order to squeeze more drops out of it, you think, what if I never had it? And that helps you appreciate it more. <laughs> I'm squeezing a dry towel, trying to get a few drops of water out of it. Wow, one drop of water appeared from my squeezing the dry towel. What if I had never tried to squeeze the towel? <laughs> What if I never ever tried to chew what has already been chewed? What would my life be like? <laughs> you never think maybe the whole endeavor for material happiness is futile. You just focus on the few drops you can squeeze out and make a big deal out of it. So those are techniques that psychologists recommend for you to have more appreciation and gratitude in your life. Think what your life would have been like if you never made that trip to Spain. <laughs> Even though you were hungover and totally wasted and totally frustrated and exasperated, still there was something there. Just think if you had never done it. Of course, devotees have another point of view. As perfectly demonstrated by Sri Dittanya Mahaprabhu. And I'll show you how this is related to our appreciation of Srila Prabhupada. There were some caste brahmanas, some external brahmanas, external only, ritualistic brahmanas, uh, very attached to their material designation, but no spiritual vitality. And they were angry because <laughs> They wanted to come to the
the meaning of the absolute term. To fully understand the meaning of Vyasa Puja, we first need to understand the meaning of Guru. Throughout the Vaishnava texts, the prominence of the spiritual master's role in a disciple's spiritually successful life is repeatedly emphasized. One must worship the Acharya, who is the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Discipleship is a two-way street. The aspiring disciple requests his or her selected guru for initiation, and conversely, the guru examines the qualities of that person to determine his or her suitability as a candidate for initiation. This selection acceptance process is not banal, like a job seeker attending an interview with, with a potential employer. When Krishna sees that the jiva is sincere, he makes the arrangement for the living entity to com come in contact with a bona fide spiritual master. Our founder Acharya, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, commented that Chaitanya Charitamrita instructs that the Guru is the manifestation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, according to all the evidence given by the Shastras, and by the practical behavior of devotees, one must accept a guru. But what kind of guru, specifically, must one accept? Srila Prabhupada explains. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives a definition of guru. Yare deka tarikaha krishna upidesh. The bona fide guru is he who advises his disciples exactly in accordance with the principles spoken by Krishna. The bona fide guru is he who has accepted Krishna as guru. This is the guru parampara system. In one sense, Vyasadev is the original guru. Srila Prabhupada explains. The original guru is Vyasadev because he is the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein everything spoken relates to Krishna. Therefore, Guru Puja is known as Vyasa Puja. In final analysis, the original guru is Krishna, his disciple is Narada, whose disciple is Vyas. And this and in this way we gradually come in touch with the Guru Parampara. Srila Prabhupada's devotion and the measurable service to the previous Acharyas, Sri Sri Radhakrishna and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, are proof of his position as the empowered devotee, the Senapati Bhakta, who revolutionized and transformed our lives in the gloom of Kali Yuga. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj writes, Kali Kalera Dharma, Krishna Nama Sankirtana, Krishna Shakti Vina Nahi Tara Pramartana. The fundamental religious system in the age of Kali is the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. Unless empowered by Krishna, one cannot propagate the Sankirtan movement. In June of 1970, in response to a letter from Tamal Krishna Das, who had inquired about the perfection of the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada wrote, A spiritual master is always liberated. In any condition of his life, he should not be mistaken as ordinary human being. Throughout my whole life, I do not know what is illicit sex, intoxication, meat-eating or gambling. So far my present life is concerned, I do not remember any part of my life when I was forgetful of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada also explains in Srimad Bhagavatam that one who is surcharged with transcendental love of Godhead can without difficulty see the personality of Godhead in every atom and every movable or immovable object. And at the same time, he can see the personality of Godhead in his own abode, Goloka, enjoying eternal pastimes with his eternal associates. Sitting in Srila Prabhupada's quarters in Mayapur in 1976 during his daily afternoon darshan, I personally heard him explain this point. When an inquisitive disciple asked him if a pure devotee sees Krishna everywhere, Prabhupada held out the cupped palm of his right hand, of his right hand and replied, even within a drop of water, the pure devotee sees Krishna and his associates and all of his pastimes. This was a mystical moment, when we caught a glimpse into Srila Prabhupada's transcendental inner world. Later I read in Srimad Bhagavatam that the Lord's pastimes are also being televised in the heart of such a devotee. 
The allegory of the man who found a gourd lying on the road points to the ingenuity of the bona fide guru. This traveler later found a stick on the path and then a wire. In themselves, the separated items were not particularly useful, but by putting the gourd, the wire, and the stick together, the man made a vena and began to play beautiful music. Similarly, Srila Prabhupada came to the West and as described in Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita, found some rejected youths lying here and there and by Krishna's grace the combination was successful. As a rock thrown into a pool creates powerful ripples affecting the entire body of water, Srila Prabhupada brought the holy name to the West, purifying a degraded world and indeed inspiring monumental although not universally acknowledged change in the broader society. The ripples have eventually become a tsunami, inundating the world with the nectar of Krishna's names. Temple-based kirtans have inspired the practice of chanting these sacred sounds even in more mundane circles. We witness this with the popularity of kirtans at yoga retreats and similar venues around the globe. An essential element of bhakti yoga is therefore to worship and serve the pure devotee. Mat bhakta puja vyadika. Krishna adv advises that worshipping his pure devotee is better than worshipping him directly. Shadiya Vaishnava Seva Nishtara Paiche Keva, says Srivanarita Dastakur. Without serving a devotee, one cannot be released from material entanglement. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself also instructed us to become not servants of Krishna directly, but servants of the servant of Krishna. Worship, worship of Srila Prabhupada on Vyasa Puja Day is not restricted to those who took direct initiation from him. For ISKCON to continue to flourish, it is imperative that all ISKCON members honor Srila Prabhupada's appearance day for at least the next 10,000 years, inspired by love and respect for his divine grace and deep gratitude <coughs> for the sacrifices he made for the good of humanity. Keeping our founder Acharya as the focal point of our spiritual society will assure that our spiritual lives will thrive. Shifting the focus spells disaster. Srila Prabhupada has uniquely presented the philosophy and practice of Bhakti Yoga in a way that is accessible to anyone, regardless of age or gender, background or birth. He has indeed cut the knots of material attachment from the core of our hearts just as he referred to his spiritual master, his divine grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, as a Vaikuntha man, so we too describe our Srila Prabhupada as no ordinary spiritual master, but as Lord Chaitanya's Senapati Bhakta, the commander-in-chief of his army of devotees. This honorific is not to be taken as exaggeration or dismissed as an overflowing of the sentiments of his followers, in Sri Chaitanya Mangala, Srila Lok Chandas Thakur describes how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself predicted the future appearance of a great Senapati Bhakta. Taking the sharp sword of the congregational chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, I will root out and destroy the demoniac mentality in the hearts of all the conditioned souls. If some sinful people escape and giving up religious principles go to far off countries, then my Senapati Bhakta will come at that time to give them Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada is without doubt that Senapati Bhakta to be honored by all Vaishnavas. In 1967, due to ill health, Srila Prabhupada planned a return to India to recuperate. His impending departure in June of that year caused much speculation and deep concern. Could his neophyte disciples carry on if he never returned? In chapter 12 of the Hare Krishna Explosion, Hai Vivadas writes, Some of the devotees, worried that Swamiji had decided to go to India to leave his body, asked him whether during his absence one of his godbrothers should come to America to assume ISKCON leadership. The minute this question was presented to him, we sensed that it was offensive. Swamiji became very grave closing his eyes, and for a moment he seemed to consider it. Then suddenly we saw tears falling down his cheeks. My Guru Maharaj, he was no ordinary spiritual master, he said, wiping away the tears. 
he saved me. Later, Swamiji told us what we should have always known. There was no one to replace him. The very idea was insulting. If someone comes and tells you something different, he said, you will be confused. The subject was dropped forever. Srila Prabhupada writes in the concluding words of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Although according to material vision, his divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur Prabhupada, passed away from this material world on the last day of December 1936, I still consider his divine grace to be always present with me by his vani, his words. I think that his divine grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, is always seeing my activities and guiding me within my heart by his words. It is to be admitted that whatever translation work I have done is through the inspiration of my spiritual master because personally I am most insignificant and incompetent to do this materially impossible work. I do not think myself a very learned scholar, but I have full faith in the service of my spiritual master, his divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur. If there is any credit to my activities of transla translating, it is all due to his divine grace. In a Srimad Bhagavatam purport, Srila Prabhupada instructs us how to worship him by paraphrasing Gurvastaka 7. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has advised that the spiritual master acting on the Supreme Lord's behalf must be worshipped as being as good as the Supreme Lord, for he is the Lord's most confidential servant in broadcasting the Lord's message for the benefit of the conditioned souls involved in the material world. The Vyasa Puja ceremony therefore celebrates the transcendental position of that spiritual master coming in the disciplic succession. He is the supreme personality of servitor Godhead. The introductory paragraph of this essay discusses the importance of accepting a guru in the disciplic succession as an essential step for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Additionally, the kind of guru the kind of nightly kirtans at the house of Srivas Thakur. The house is called Srivas Angan. But they were banned. Lord Titania had strict orders. <coughs> Only pure devotees could attend those nightly kirtans. And those nightly kirtans were equivalent to the Rasa Lila. So The next morning, one of those external materialistic brahmanas was so angry when he approached Lord Chaitanya, he decided to curse him. So in the days when brahmanas had some kind of potency, even if they were material brahmanas with no bhakti, they still had some material shakti, some mystic powers. So when they would curse someone, they would take out their Brahmin strip and break it and utter the curse. So he did that to Lord Chaitanya. You didn't let me in for the kirtan. I hereby curse you. He took out his Brahmin strip. I curse you that you will never experience material happiness. <laughs> and of course, as you know, Mahaprabhu jumped in the air. How <laughs> wonderful, how <I'm> wonderful. <laughs> we want to make gradual progress toward that realization. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Bhakti is a gradual process of becoming aligned with Krishna's pleasure and gradually relinquishing our silly concepts of pleasure. It's a whole career, so <laughs> don't worry that you have to act in a way beyond your realization. But you should be progressive in your bhakti, making progress toward that goal. So anyway, a fully developed devotee is quite happy uh, about not having to squeeze pleasure out of reminiscences and not having to go through the whole practice of let me think what it would have been like if I hadn't done that 
even though it was a deficient experience, even though it was, there were so many problems, still there were a few drops, there were a few drops. Those few drops make it all worthwhile. That's what you're supposed to think. Have gratitude for the few drops. Have gratitude for chewing the chewed. <laughs> but today we can genuinely think in a thought experiment. What would my life be like if Srila Prabhupada hadn't brought bhakti to the whole world? What would my life be like? And yes, we can genuinely save her. The inconceivable oh. gift that we have. What if I didn't have that gift? What if Srila Prabhupada did not set forth on the Jala Dutta? Sailing from India over the seas, enduring two heart attacks, struggling alone in New York, a fierce winter, coming from India and for the first time facing a northern hemisphere winter, it's snow and blizzards. <coughs> what would my life have been like without Shiva Prabhupada's unparalleled contribution? First of all, you shudder when you think of your sinful activities that would have no relief, no exoneration, no purification. Most of us didn't even think there were really such things as sinful activities. <laughs> and if we did think about it, we just excused ourselves, saying, well, it wasn't so bad, really. I know persons who've done much worse. <laughs> <laughs> but when we think of our sinful activities, and of course we can't remember our sinful activities for the countless lifetimes before. We can't remember that. But even what we think of in this lifetime, we're so embarrassed, we're so disgusted, how could I have trashed myself out in that way? In such ignorance. And just think, to have gone through your whole life never <clears throat> cleansing those sinful reactions to sinful activities. Just think of what our destiny would have been. What body we would take in the next life. The deadly sinful activities <coughs> that we promise to refrain from at the time of initiation. Illicit sex, meat eating, gambling, intoxication. Those deadly sinful activities we consider no, just nothing. It's part of life. Everyone's doing it. Mm. Our pleasure-seeking nature of the spirit soul as expressed through the body and mind put us into such horrible situations with horrible results. I mean, we were so ignorant, we didn't care. I'm just making my life. What do you want out of me? I'm just trying to do what I can do, you know? Trying to be happy, trying not to hurt too many people. What do you want out of me? We'd excuse ourselves in that way. Eating some meat here, getting a little intoxication there, having a bit of illicit sex here. A little gambling there. It's all part of life. We had no concept of reactions to actions. Reactions to sinful activity. We think, I'm just pushing on my life. That's all. I'm just proceeding with my life. Everyone's pushing on their life <laughs> as best they can. We crowned ourselves with a sense of with a false sense of innocence, a false sense of justification, purpose, and meaning. Yet, we would have had to face such excruciating sinful reactions. We would experience the results of the ignorance in this lifetime, and much worse in the next lifetime. We had no idea and even if some of us had some idea that I'm 
performing sinful activities. We had no way of cleansing the reactions. No way. We're helpless. Helpless in the grip of sinful reactions. Sometimes in evangelical churches, <laughs> you know, real fundamentalist Christian churches, there's fire and brimstone preaching. You're sinners in the hand of an angry God who's ready to zap you <laughs> for all your devilishness. <laughs> well, the truth is, we're not so much sinners in the hands of an angry God. And Krishna's got better things to do then. <laughs> than smash us. <laughs> if Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. He's Jamuna Tiravanachari, Gopi Jana Baba Bhakti Kalikari. He's sporting with his coward friends and attracting his girlfriends. So it's not that the hand of God is going to smash us, it's the reactions to our sinful activities. <laughs> Actions have reactions. And so it was the it was those reactions that were waiting to smash us. Reactions to our own activities. And we had no solution to that. Most of us weren't even aware of that. We don't understand fully the horrors that would have awaited us. Is it just some scare talk to make us try to be more Krishna conscious? Prabhu's, if you only knew what you, what your destiny would have been. Are we meant to instill such fear in you so you'll practice bhakti? <laughs> Sinners, repent. If you only knew of the flames of hell that were waiting for you. <laughs> we actually didn't know the scope and extent of the reactions to our actions. And how many lifetimes those reactions would have come to us in. I remember on a walk with Srila Prabhupada in Los Angeles. <clears throat> I was there and a devotee asked Srila Prabhupada, what is the, the next birth for most of the persons who've taken birth in Kali Yuga at this point in time, presently? What is most likely their next birth? And Srila Prabhupada replies very solemnly that most people today in these times are heading for animal births. Now the surprising thing is that so many people, if you tell them that, first of all, if they want to think about it at all, they'll just say, well, what's so bad about that? <laughs> many of you might have said that, right? What's so bad about that? And what is the main principle? The main principle is ignorance. You think that's going to come to your rescue. Ignorance meaning, if I become a dog or cat, as long as I don't remember I was a human being, I'll be satisfied. We think that's, well, that's quite a dynamic and <laughs> helpful factor. If I don't remember, then it's okay. I'll just be a happy dog. <laughs> but just see how the whole, your whole, Attitude is based on ignorance. As long as I'm dumbed down, as long as I'm covered over, then I'll be happy. How is that real happiness to be dumbed down, covered over, and ignorant? Real happiness is based on full awareness. That's why we say Satchitananda, eternity, full knowledge, and complete bliss. But we got this crazy notion about ignorance and forgetfulness. Yesterday, you hit me over the head with a hammer. But 
as long as today I don't remember, it's okay. <laughs> I may have a headache, but as long as I don't remember what happened yesterday, everything is fine. So this is our crazy attitude. All based on ignorance. Now, if I said to you, become a dog now. Oh, I'm horrible. No, no, I can't do that. I don't want to become a dog now. But if I say, when you become a dog, you'll forget that you're a human being. Oh, well, that's yeah, something to consider. <laughs> it's not craziness. You won't want to be forced into a dog's body now with full awareness. But if you forget, if you have no consciousness of what you were before, then you'll accept it. That's what most people will say. Yeah, as long as I don't remember as a human being, I'll just be happy as a dog. What's the problem? Mm. This is how out of it we were. First of all, no knowledge of what our next body would be. And secondly, even if we thought about so-called reincarnation, I'll just be whatever I will be. Maybe even some of you here said, the universe will take care of me. Anyone here like that? Said like that? Esther, you said like that? Oh. <laughs> Any other airy fairies? <laughs> <laughs> the universe is, is looking out for me. <laughs> I just trust in the universe. <laughs> so Shiloh Prabhupada's contribution cannot be measured. Simply for its saving us from our sinful reactions. <laughs> we have knowledge of what is sinful activity. We have the means to purify ourselves from the reactions to sinful activity. So just on that basis alone, Srila Prabhupada has saved us from the greatest calamity, losing our human form of life. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, of just a little advancement in bhakti will save us from the greatest disaster. And that greatest disaster is losing your human form of life. So you may wonder, you'll see right before your eyes, persons take up bhakti and then drop it. It could be your own friend, it could be your own family member. It happens. We're not utopians, we're not pie in the sky dreamers, we know. Some persons will start following the doctor's orders, become purified to some degree, and then they'll slack off, stop taking their medicine, and merge into the material energy. So you might think, well, why do they do that? Maybe there's something wrong with the bhakti process. No, the mistake is in their application, lack of serious application. But what was Srila Prabhupada's attitude when dealing with the inevitable uh, dissolution of some who had come to bhakti, taken initiation, then gone off. What was his reaction? He quoted the verse from the first canto, spoken by Narada Muni, that better they take up bhakti and drop it than never take it up at all. Because even if you execute all your material activities perfectly, but never make an effort in bhakti, your life's a waste. But if you take up bhakti and somehow other, due to your carelessness, you slip, you fall, you fall away. Still, your life is immeasurably better. You'll if you don't come back in this lifetime, and sometimes you see devotees 
miraculously making their way out of the illusory energy for a second try. And sometimes they don't. But they will keep their spiritual credit. And in the next life, they'll start where they left off. That's why you'll see in your efforts to distribute Krishna consciousness to others. In your efforts to cultivate others. You see some people just pick it up right away. Because they're starting from where they left off in their previous life. For example, maybe Bhakta Mike was like that. <laughs> he was merged in ignorance on his holiday tour. And then a Harinam party goes by. What's that? <laughs> and his life goes in another direction. So, There's no loss. But you don't have to be inattentive and fall away from your bhakti. But the point is, as Srila Prabhupada's attitude was, better they come and go than not come at all. Because the credit they get will be eternal. So when presented with the inevitable fact that Persons would come and go in Krishna consciousness. He said, that's all right. I'm doing this on the authority of Narada Muni. And it's Narada Muni who said, Takda Sudamam Chadanam Bhujapan. Better to have a little bhakti, even if they go, then they never try at all. Because even if they do all their material affairs perfectly, they get no credit <laughs> at the end of life. They have to face all the sinful reactions. <clears throat> but just by a little beginning in bhakti. Guru is of critical importance. That spiritual master is one who has himself served a pure devotee in the disciplic succession. Trying to develop spiritual life without accepting a bona fide guru will lead only to failure. In March of 1975, in Atlanta, on the appearance day of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada delivered a discourse in which he emphatically instructed his disciples on the importance of accepting a bona fide spiritual master. So try to receive Krishna's grace through the disciplic succession coming from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then you will understand everything. Yasya Deve Pra Bhaktir Yata Deve Tathagura. This is the process, Vedic process. One should have unflinching faith in God and spiritual master. Don't jump over to God crossing the spiritual master, then it will be failure. You must go through. We are observing Vyasa Puja ceremony, the birth anniversary of our Guru Maharaj. Why? We cannot understand Krishna without spiritual master. If anyone wants to understand Krishna by jumping over the spiritual master, then immediately he becomes a bogus. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Guru Krishna Kripaya Paya Bhakti Lata Bij. That is Vedic injunction. Tat Vidi Pranipatena Pari Prashnena Sevaya. Nobody can understand Krishna without going through his most confidential servant. This is the meaning of this Vyasa Puja. You cannot surpass. If you think that you have become very learned and very advanced, now you can avoid the spiritual master and you understand Krishna, that is bogus. That is the meaning of this Yasa Puja ceremony. We should always pray, Yasya Prasada, Yasya Prasada, Yasya Prasada. Only by the grace of the spiritual master, we can achieve the grace or mercy of Krishna. This is the meaning of this Yasa Puja. Offering obeisances by parampara system. Further exploring the meaning of Vyasa Puja, we can pose this question. How should this sacred and ancient tradition be conducted? On February 25, 1970, on Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur's Vyasa Puja Day, the Los Angeles devotees saw Srila Prabhupada offer arti to a large picture of his Guru Maharaj. After the arti, 
he directed his disciples in offering flowers to the picture of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Still standing before the picture, he said he had nothing to offer his spiritual master on that day except his disciples. He then read aloud the names of all his disciples. By contrast, in Tokyo, later that year, on the 74th anniversary of Srila Prabhupada's appearance, it was apparent that the devotees did not know how to observe the etiquette of celebrating the spiritual master Vyasa Puja. He asked the devotees whether they had not seen how he had observed the Vyasa Puja of his spiritual master in Los Angeles. <coughs> Confused by his request for the pushpa, flowers, devotees brought him pushpa rice instead. Srila Prabhupada scolded his disciples for concocting and for acting improperly. He said that in devotional service, everything must be done properly, according to the Parampara method, without fabrication. The next day, wrote Satsuru Das Goswami in Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita, a simple, traditional ceremony was performed and the devotees felt ecstatic. By pleasing the spiritual master, then everyone is pleased. All the practitioners of bhakti yoga are duty bound to be loyal servants of the parampara system, being mindful of the correct way of performing devotional services to the Lord and the spiritual master. Thus the Vyasa Puja celebration epitomizes the true meaning of faithfully following in the line of our Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya without deviation and with full concentration. The Vyasa Puja day is the grand and solemn occasion when we join together throughout the world to honor our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. With hearts full of deep spiritual emotions, we meditate on the sacrifices he made out of love for his spiritual master and for all of us. Like the sparrow trying to dry up the ocean, we attempt to glorify him and express our deep love and respect for him. In a letter to Bali Mardandas, dated August 25, 1970, Srila Prabhupada wrote, the spiritual master is the representative of Yasadev because he carries the message of Yasadev throughout the world. As members of ISKCON, we specifically rededicate ourselves to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada, the great representative of Yasadev, on Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja Day. We can also resolve that every day throughout the whole year we will rededicate ourselves to serving him and his movement and remembering that Srila Prabhupada is always with us through his body. Again in the Lilamrita, Satsuru Das Goswami recounts the intense feelings of separation two members of Srila Prabhupada's fledgling movement experienced due to his impending return to America in December 1967, after a six-month sojourn in India to regain his health. When the day for Srila Prabhupada's departure finally arrived, he gave last instructions to Achyutananda and Ramanuja. Just pray to Lord Krishna that I can go to America, he requested Achyutananda. How can I? Achyutananda replied. You'll be leaving me. No, Srila Prabhupada replied. We'll always remain packed up together if you remember my teachings. If you preach, you will become strong and all these teachings will be in the proper perspective. When we stop our preaching, then everything becomes stagnated and we lose our life. If we remain sincere and honor Srila Prabhupada, not only on his Vyasa Puja day, but every moment of our lives, his ISKCON will continue to thrive and our lives will be successful. We will remain packed up with Srila Prabhupada. The mission of the spiritual master is the mission of the Supreme Personality of Godhead to spread Krishna Consciousness all over the world. And Srila Prabhupada's mission is our mission. That is the true meaning of Yasa Puja. Krishna Rupa Devas. Dear Srila Prabhupada, please accept my most respectful obeisances at your lotus feet.
especially on your Divine Appearance Day, I first strive to express my unbounded gratitude for your purely transmitting the Maha Mantra. A bestowal, a bestowal apparently so simple, yet truly so miraculous, as the years and decades in bhakti pass, increasingly, even this lowly disciple can catch a glimpse of the reality that Srila Bhakti Manod Thakur declared. In all 14 worlds, there's nothing to be had except the holy name of Krishna. Next, I urgently thank you for opportunities to engage the senses in Krishna's service. For the past two weeks, I have been meditating on the words in your purport to Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, chapter 12, text 13. A devotee has no other ambition than to serve Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. This Krishna Conscious Movement was started to engage people 24 hours daily in the service of the Lord and in His glorification. So that was one of your foundational motivations. You began ISKCON as a device to engage people 24 hours daily in the service of the Lord. In the current ISKCON context, how can we fulfill this desire? It would seem that whether devotees live in their own home, in an ashram, or in a devotional community, somehow every devotee, regardless of one's accustomed level of bhakti intensity, should have ready access to the impetus, the inspiration, and the capability, the techniques, for engaging in devotional service morning, noon, and night. To you, I acknowledge, although so inadequately, my eternal indebtedness for your pure gifts of the Maha Mantra, accompanied by absorption in devotional service. We call out to the whole world, tactfully yet persistently proclaiming that even in this most desperate and degraded era, your process inherited from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu certainly works. Aspiring to be your servant. Dear Srila Prabhupada, please accept my humble messages at your lotus feet. This year I have tried to compose a poem in glorification of the books that you so painstakingly composed to and gave to us. From your room in Vrindavan, Rose as brilliant as the sun, Krishna in his literary form. This Bhagavata Purana's light you shone through Kali's dense dark night and saved us from that godless sinful storm. From Lord Sri Krishna's lotus feet, you invite the world to meet his all attractive smiling lotus face. Explaining his controlling feature, before divulging Nitya Leela, 
patiently you guide us by your grace. Krishna's words you have stated purely unadulterated in your Bhagavad Gita as it is. Only by unalloyed bhakti can the Lord be known directly. The Lord's right to explain himself is his. Along with Bhagavatam and Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita nourishes the lives of all who listen. Relishing nectarian sweetness, empty hearts can taste completeness. Serving Goranatai, their faces glisten. To soothe my mind before I sleep, I have no need for counting sheep. I read the splendorous Krishna book instead. To simply do this every day is the most effective way to blissfully return home back to Godhead. And your nectar of devotion reveal, reveals the Bhakti Rasa ocean where devotees like aquatics swim. A law book of all Bhakti dealings describing the exalted feelings Krishna's pure associates have for him. Suitable for deep heart cleaning, all your books have layers of meaning brought to life for one who serves your mission. Like a jewel with light shone through, each side shows a different hue, so they shine from all angles of vision. To read these books for hours a day and distribute them come what may is a life of transcendental bliss. Let book distributors roam with sets of books for every home. Let me always be engaged like this. Reaching for your lotus hand, struggling hard to understand, Vamshi Balasi Das begs for this. Srila Prabhupada. Please accept my humble obeisances over us during this most auspicious day of your appearance. Time certainly flies in Krishna consciousness. That fateful day when I first came in contact with you seems just like yesterday. I remember so vividly when I walked into the garage of a drug dealer whom I was staying with in South Auckland to see a book standing <laughs> upright. <laughs> And his, <coughs> that picture of you on the front cover, with a great shadow draped dra over your shoulder, you look so aristocratic and regal, like a real authority. Immediately, I was attracted and stole that book from him. <laughs> if I had known back then that the ne for the next sixteen years. If I'd lived in a life of a celibate monk, I probably would have put the book back exactly where I found it. But hearing the message of your mission, your motivations, and the reasons behind that book being left on that coffee table, the depth of my gratitude and indebtedness towards you knows no limits, for certainly I was on a crash course heading for self-destruction. You told your disciples that on the appearance day of Shilabhakta Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, that they can pray to him for strength to maintain their vow of celibacy, since he was a strict Nashtika Brahmachari throughout his whole life. So on this auspicious day of your appearance, I'm going to pray to you that I can acquire the deep ocean of compassion that you have. For this is certainly a most wonderful Vaishnava quality. His Holiness Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami once said to you that, quote, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have observed that you are in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. He replied, Very good, you have understood correctly. And what was that mood of Prahlad Maharaj? Naibod Vijay Puratarat Yavaitaranyas 
พระดีจะใจนามหามิตรมรณชิตาโชเชตโตกัลกัจจะสัยงริยาตามายาสุกายาบาลุตาโตกัลุตาโอ้ best of great personalities I am not at all afraid of material existence for wherever I stay I am fully absorbed in thoughts of your glories and activities my only concern is for the poor fools and rascals who are making elaborate plans for material happiness And maintaining their families, societies, and countries, I am simply concerned with love for them. Compassion was the driving force for s h i l a b a k t i v a n a t a k o to pioneer preaching in the West by sending his books, Lord Chaitanya, his life and precepts, to various universities in the Western world. Compassion was the driving force for s h i l a b a k t i s i d a n t a Saraswati t a k o to give you the instruction to preach Krishna consciousness in the English-speaking language. And compassion was the driving force for you to board the Jaladuta and voluntarily accept all the trials and tribulations of spreading Krishna consciousness throughout the West. And certainly, compassion was the driving force for you to pour your heart out into the Bhakti Vedanta purports. All the while, accepting thousands of disciples all over the world, of whom many received letters personally from you, giving essential guidance and encouragement in their devotional life. In order for Lord Chaitanya's mission to continue, compassion has to be there. I humbly beg that you bestow your mercy on this fallen soul, so that I can effectively cultivate this most profound rational quality and become a suitable instrument to be used to assist in spreading Lord Chaitanya's movement. Your servant. Should I put a t e e a a Even if you're unfortunate that you slip away, you'll at least get a human form of life in your next birth in a nice family. Nice families are hard to find <laughs> these days, but you're guaranteed a human form of life in a nice family situation, so you can make further <clears throat> spiritual progress in your next life. So just considering protection from sinful reactions, we cannot get to the bottom of Shiva Prabhupada's contribution for our life. What were you going to do about your sinful reactions? And what protection did you have from performing more sinful reactions? We've been given a lifestyle that is reaction-free, karma-free. It's not simply that we believe and then we're saved. No, we have a lifestyle that saves us, a lifestyle that is karma-free. So again, just by considering how we've been. Rescued from the atrocious, horrible reactions to our actions. Just that is an unparalleled contribution by Shiva Prabhupada. Then you consider the positive. There's bhakti involves positive and negative. Things not to be done and things to do. When you consider the positive, a chance to revive our dormant love of Krishna. Who are we to deserve this opportunity? We need to really face that fact with humility. Who am I to deserve a chance to chant the Hare Krishna mantra, to associate with devotees, to read s h i m a d Bhagavatam, Chaitanya c h a r i t a m i t Who am I to deserve such a thing? To have this greatest opportunity, <clears throat> how did I merit this? The fact is, we don't merit it. 
This is why we say, Lord Chaitanya is causeless mercy. There's no, we, there's no cause in that. We have no qualification. I deserve this. <laughs> no. The flood of Lord Chaitanya's mercy has covered us, even though we have no qualification and we don't deserve it. So when you understand that you don't deserve something, yet you have it, that thought makes you extraordinarily appreciative. What gives me the right to serve Krishna? How did I get this greatest fortune to sweep a floor for Krishna, to make a garland, to wash some pots for Krishna, to distribute Krishna's glories, to help arrange and manage the affairs of devotional service, to help cultivate others, to help guide others? Who am I to have such an opportunity? And what to speak of? The chance to chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Sometimes when you're chanting, it seems a bit of a struggle. You're just not able to focus as much as you want. At those times we have to beg Krishna, please let me chant your name. Because we take it for granted. Yeah, I'm a devotee. Yeah. I mumble the mantra. <laughs> we take it for granted. We become desensitized and mechanical. That's the nature of personal affairs. Impersonalism creeps in. Robotism creeps in. But at those times when your tongue and your mind are struggling, you beg Krishna and thank Krishna for the opportunity to chant his name. And you'll see the difference. So Srila Prabhupada saved us on the negative side and gave us the greatest opportunity on the positive side. An opportunity to develop love for Krishna. Love for Krishna is the only thing that will satisfy our loving propensity. And we have that opportunity for life's ultimate goal. So many of you are young, and you're probably thinking, you have no idea what it's like to be older. <laughs> but it will happen. <coughs> And to be able to look back at your life and see, I have a, I had and have a chance to serve Krishna. How wonderful is that? To be able to look back on the decades of your life and see, I had the greatest opportunity. I tried to take advantage as much as I can. I could have taken advantage more, but at least I was, in, I was in the arena somehow. I was on the playing field. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> I may not have scored all the goals I wanted, but I, at least I was on the playing field. That thought is amazing. Just think of all the ways you could have trashed out your 20s and 30s and 40s. <laughs> Working like a dog. Getting wasted like like some lecherous, crazy person. Struggling with relationship after relationship. Shall I hook up with you? Or shall I hook up with you? Will you hook up with me? Ah, no, no. Chewing the chew, scratching the scratch. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been our life. <laughs> Instead, we're on the playing field of bhakti. We don't deserve to be in that arena. But Srila Prabhupada has given us this greatest opportunity. He once explained that bhakti yogis, Vaishnavas, are the greatest opportunists. We're always on the lookout for opportunities to serve Krishna. Yes! Do you see that? Let's do it. 
Did you see this opportunity? Did you, did you see this opening? Let's go for it. So we had this chance for the highest goal of life. Yes, often people don't understand. What are you doing with your life? <laughs> what is this dedication to chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, engaging in devotional service, reading those books? What, 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 what's, what's the big deal? What about the real world? You should be struggling like everyone else. You should be You should be trying to chew the chew like everyone else. Even though it, the experience is deficient, we all know that. Still, it's what everyone else is doing, and you shouldn't let everyone down. <laughs> yes. Even though the struggle is basically futile, that's okay. Everyone's doing it, and you should have your place in the ranks. <laughs> yeah. Since life, you know, a futile struggle. At least everyone else is struggling too. So with your bodies, with your minds, you try to get some satisfaction in, in the normal way. Who are you to break free from this? Who do you think you are? You're proud, that's it. You think you're special. <laughs> anyway, Someone really cynical would say, anyway, what are you saving yourself from anyway? There's lots of stuff out there to do. It may not be the best, but it's something. Why keep yourself on a shelf? Get out and chew the chew. Scratch the scratch. <laughs> Even though the experience is deficient, it's what everyone else is doing. They're strength in numbers. <laughs> Billions of people are acting in this way. <clears throat> Who are you to go a different route? What do you think you are? A saint? <laughs> Get real. <laughs> Join the crowd before it's too late. <laughs> anyway, after all, you've got to enjoy it before you become old and sick. So the gun they hold to your head is, just think, when you reach... 50 or 60, and you haven't had your quota of material enjoyment, just think what a disaster that would be. <laughs> they try to rattle your cage in that way. Come on, Jaya Dave, just think. <laughs> Do you want to become 50 or 60 and, and not have your fair share of material enjoyment? <laughs> <laughs> You'll feel horrible. Oh no, I'm old and I haven't enjoyed. <laughs> Why did I not act like a crazy fool when I was young? I, I just be wild. At least it was something, and now it's too late. My hair is gray, my body is breaking down. <laughs> My only hope is the internet. <laughs> My only hope is internet pornography. <laughs> so that's what they're saying. That's the gun they're holding to your head. You could you you could miss out. <laughs> miss out on what? What is anyone doing that's actually original, creative, and exciting. It's the same old, same old. But we have a different vision of life. We say, what? Just think, if I had never taken up devotional service, if I had never encountered Srila Prabhupada's gifts, if Srila Prabhupada had never gotten aboard the Jaladuta and sailed for the West, what would my life be like? I would just be crazy and mad and I might not probably not even be alive. I probably would have done myself in this way or that way. 
-hmm. Voluntarily or involuntarily. <clears throat> so one side is thinking. One batch of people is thinking. Just think. You, you go through life and not have a chance that your senses go wild sufficiently. What is sufficiently? <laughs> There's no sufficiently. You become 50, 60, 70 and still have all these desires. It's too late. <laughs> but that one batch of persons thinking like that, another batch of persons, we are thinking to have gone through life without a chance to serve Krishna. Oh, the greatest disaster. If Srila Prabhupada had never brought the greatest gift in life. If he had never brought that outside of India, what would my life have been like? Oh, I shake and shudder to think about it. So just two different views. So we cannot express our gratitude to Srila Prabhupada sufficiently. The miracle of pure devotion. Krishna wants to see his devotee glorified more than himself glorified. So therefore, as Bhakti Rano Thakur says, Krishna say Tomar, Krishna Tite. Krishna, you are the property of your devotee. Therefore, I'm simply running after the devotee shouting Krishna, Krishna. I'm not running after Krishna directly. I'm running after Krishna's devotee shouting Krishna, Krishna. So we want to create followers of Srila Prabhupada through Prampara that are able to give shelter to others. Because sometimes bhakti is a challenge. Because your spirit souls practicing bhakti in the material world and the material body, there are challenges. But if we have support and good guidance, we can make it through those challenges. So the crucial point is not that you're experiencing a challenge. The crucial point is, did you make your way through that challenge? So we need to have sympathy for devotees who are going through challenges while making available support for going through those challenges. And then those devotees who've gone through challenges will be able to help others. We don't want bhakti to be an all or nothing experience. Either you become a paramahansa Overnight or bust. We want to be with devotees and care for them as they go through the inevitable challenge of being a spirit soul of the material. Our motivation is incalculable gratitude for what we've been given. So we can genuinely think, we can genuinely think, what would my life have been like without Srila Prabhupada's service that he did in bringing Krishna to the whole world and creating a support system for devotees to practice bhakti? What would my life have been without? And this way, our genuine appreciation will increase. So remember, the materialists are urging you, in order to savor material pleasure more, you have to think, even though this thrill is temporary, it's fading away, at least I had it. <laughs> so that's the rationale presented to you. Yeah, it's deficient, it's hackneyed, it loses its luster and freshness, but at least you had it. <laughs> Even if you almost had it, that's still something 
to be grateful for. <laughs> yes, you, I almost had it. I almost had it. Wow, you almost had it. <laughs> That's almost as good as having it. This is how desperate people are. I almost had it. I almost had it. <laughs> wow, you were that close, huh? <laughs> But in bhakti, we have it day after day. So we beg the Srila Prabhupada on this most auspicious day. We beg that we can appreciate the opportunity of bhakti every day and take advantage of it. And that requires effort. Relationships always require effort. And this is the greatest relationship with Krishna through Prampara. All right. <laughs>